We uh, are looking forward to a good morning here together, and uh, of course today our theme being solidarity. We have uh, a wonderful family of ministry in CCDA, and this morning we are in a coffee shop, but we have no coffee, we have water. We already have enough caffeine on this panel that we didn't need any more. But we're here together today just to have a conversation, and our conversation is going to kind of be with each other. You're going to sit in on that, and we're going to talk about being single in ministry. You know, ministry, uh, we at CCDA view ourselves as a family. Yesterday we mentioned the body of Christ and how we are all one in the body of Christ, and God has given us different gifts and different abilities and talents, and we're different kinds of people. And all of us are significant and all of us are important. And, and we hold the family in CCDA to be very significant and very important. But a part of the family is not just the, the family that we sometimes talk about of a husband and wife and children, because we have all kinds of people in ministry and particularly single folks who are in ministry. And so to, today, this morning, we're gonna spend a little time about what that looks like. We've got four wonderful people who I've had the privilege of knowing all of them for quite some time, and they're, they're all single, they're all in ministry, and they all have a perspective on that. And so our goal is to hear from them. We want to affirm all of you. How many of you are here that are single and are in ministry? Raise your hand if you're single. All right, amen. We would be incomplete without those of you who are here, and you are extremely important, and so today we want to think a little bit about that. So we're going to uh, take a minute and uh, introduce ourselves, and we're going to just begin with this handsome man over on the, uh, my right. <laughs> That's an handsome man. Huh? <laughs> All right. Well, this is a beautiful conversation, and my name is Shane Claiborne, and uh, I'm a part of a community in Philadelphia called The Simple Way. I'm Elizabeth Perkins, and I um, am a part of an organization called the John and Vera May Perkins Foundation. We've heard of that. Maybe so. <laughs> All right. Good morning. My name is Chrissy Brooks, and I am with MICA Community Development Corporation in Costa Mesa, California. My name is Marcos Gomez. I'm a student at Fuller Theological Seminary, also youth pastoring at a church called Eagle Rock Church of the Nazarene. Used to be in Chicago. Chicago, Lawndale. Yeah, youth pastor there in Lawndale for many years, and then just yeah, felt called to go out there to Fuller. But yeah, definitely uh, Lawndale. So gotta always give a yeah, shout yeah, out I for do, Chicago. I do, I do. You know, That's right. all right, but, uh, all right. I always rep Shy in Pasadena or Los Angeles, wherever I go. So uh, I guess I should rep them here. Yeah, all right, good, Marcos. Um, well, let's. What we want to let's let's have. Uh, let's. I'd like to hear from each one of you a little bit. And Chrissy, why don't we begin with you? Uh, just sharing with us a little bit uh, your experience of being in ministry and being single and what that looks like for you. Yeah, um, so I'm working in my hometown where I grew up and my parents are known there and so, you know, it often comes up like, oh, what's going on with you? Are you, are you, are you married yet? And um, are, are you still doing that thing in the neighborhood? Um, you know, as if like when I get married, then I will stop doing that. Um, and so I think that that's one thing that comes up for me a lot is that this, this is what I do. Uh, whether I'm single or married, I, I plan to be doing this. Uh, so that, that's one thing. And I, I, lately, when, probably my latest reflections on this have been when I studied the scripture, I reread Revelation. And as I was reading about the church as the bride of Christ, I thought, you know, I identify with this, this idea that we are... Um, expectantly waiting for the bridegroom and oftentimes I just want to think you know maybe I'm just not gonna get married I'll just be single it just he's not coming let's forget it and that seems easier to, for, for me sometimes but as believers we live in anticipation the people of God have always been people of hope and when I start to give that up I think you know I have an opportunity to reflect to my brothers and sisters what it looks like to expectantly wait for the bridegroom. And lately I've been speaking with my brothers and sisters about, can you affirm me in that? Can you say in you, we see something of the bride of Christ. And in those who are single in our church, um, we can learn what it's like to be the church waiting for the bridegroom. And 
I find that to be a much more affirming position than, hey, we want to hook you up with someone because when you're like us, then you'll have made it. Or when you're married like us, then um, you'll have somehow a more significant position in, in our family. Um, so that's kind of been my latest reflections mm -hmm. on it. All right. Marcos, give us a little bit of your thinking about this and what it's been like for you uh, as a single person in ministry. Okay, so they didn't want me to preach. I brought the word up. They all got nervous. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, man. But you know what? Okay, so, thank so, you, Marcos. Yeah, Let's I'm not move gonna... on. <laughs> yeah, but real talk, though, uh, moving out to Los Angeles was, uh, uh, was a good move, but a hard move because Los Angeles is kind of a, a lonely city. All my networks and families in Chicago. So going over there, it just took me a while to adjust. But um, I remember I was crying out to the Lord just about school and the whole retransitioning back to school and being in the city of LA and, and, and needing to reestablish kind of grassroots networks and stuff. Um, yeah, it was hard. I was just I was crying out to the Lord and, um, and I was just seeking him. So I got up, I was like, Lord, I need your help with all of these things and, and, and it's hard out here. I need your presence really during mm -hmm. this season of, of perceived loneliness. And at that point it was already starting to feel lonely. And then um, I got up and started to go about my business. But, but I felt like the Lord was calling me back to just listen to him in prayer. And, and so I did, and I said, Lord, if you want to say anything to me, go ahead and, and do that, whether it's a, a scripture verse or a vision uh, of a picture or something. And so, so I did that, and, and I heard this, this verse of Luke 1.13, and it just kind of stayed there. And I wasn't sure if it was like, all right, this is me doing this or what's going on, but it wouldn't leave, and so I didn't even know what the reference was to, but I just kind of opened up the scriptures, and it, it was where the angel of the Lord came to Zechariah, and he just said, you know, Zechariah, you know, fear not, uh, the Lord has heard your prayer. And I felt like I was telling him, you know what, I've heard your prayer, I've heard your cry, and, and I want you not to be afraid about these various things, even your singleness. I don't yeah. want you to be fearful about this. I, I, I've heard your prayer. I've heard the cry of your heart. And, and that right there, I tied to Psalms as well. Psalms 8, where David kind of talks about this whole thing that uh, he considers, uh, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him. Uh, and sometimes when we pray, we think about, man, God, there's so many other things out there. You know what I mean? I think about being in, since I've been in L.A., like things have popped off really hard in Chicago. I mean, I've been looking at CNN and just the shootings, like murders and all that have gone up in the past two years. Uh, not that it wasn't violent when I was back in Lawndale, but it, it just shot up. So I just think, you know, there's other prayer requests out there more worthy of God's attention that he cares about than about my singleness or anybody else's singleness. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but God... It's like when you consider all these things and all the greater glories and maybe all the greater needs, man, God's still mindful of our, our, our needs, whatever they may be, yeah. and that he cares for us. And so that prayer, and God lead me to the scripture saying, hey, do not be afraid. Right. So uh, I think that would be my piece on yeah. this whole, That's for right what, now. You know, and I, I think we're, we're, we've heard two, two, two thoughts here about being single. You know, Chrissy, you're talking about how there's this expectation, you know, when are you getting married? When are you getting married? There, so there's this expectation that marriage is the only way to be. Uh, and then I hear you, Marco, saying that, you know, being alone, single, there's some loneliness there. So these are two things that you as single people have dealt with. Now, Shane, let's, let's talk to you for a sec. Um, you know, you've made some commitments at, sing, uh, at si The Simple Way, and, you know, we love your lifestyle, and, and you know, I love your clothes, uh, I love your hair, and you are a handsome man. Uh, so, uh, living... All the single ladies. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, well... Uh, you first, you made a vow. Put a ring on it, though. Is that right? You made a, a vow celibacy? <laughs> Uh, can we pray? Um, no, 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 I, I um, oh, you know, I, I, first of all, I, w I was raised in East Tennessee, and, and I'm, I'm an only child and an only grandchild on both sides. Wow. Uh, yeah, that, that's a lot of burden for a young yeah. man to bear, you know, a lot of responsibility. And, and There's a little pressure I there. I always had that, you know. And, and in fact, and I can remember it being reinforced in the church. I, I can remember hearing a children's sermon where the pastor literally uh, brought all the children forward, held up a picture of a husband and wife and two kids, and prayed for all the kids to find that the, the one that God had for them. Hmm. Now, 
it was only later that I came to see what terrible theology that was, you know, um, because I, and what a gift singleness has been throughout the history of the church. I mean, start with Jesus, you know, but then I look at folks that became heroes of mine. Uh, and, and there are married folks, you know, like John and Vera Mae, but there's, there's other folks like Mother Teresa that I look at her and I don't go, poor thing, if only she had met her husband, you know. <laughs> yeah. But their singleness was a part of how they were able to recklessly pursue the kingdom of God with all that they were. And, and it was, it, it's more recently that I've uh, been mentored by uh, mostly Catholic mentors that have taken a vow of celibacy and have raised even the idea of that. Like, why would someone take a vow to that? You know, like a lot of people are trying to go to singles groups to meet somebody, you know, and things like that. So, so, um, and I've been wrestling through that, you know, and I, I you know, I'm, I may say a little bit more, but I, I, I certainly have uh, enjoyed what singleness has to bring, and, and I've been dating someone now, and I'm, I'm thinking through that and praying through that with my community. Um, but one of the things I'll never forget that my mentor it taught me is he says, we, we get so obsessed with sex, and he said, but we can live without sex. What we can't live without is love. And there's a lot of people that have a lot of sex, and they never get love and intimacy. And there's other people that live their entire lives without ever having sex, and they experience love and intimacy and meaning so deeply. And some of the healthiest people I know are, are celibate single folks. So, so I think there, there's really a need to figure out, and the question that I'm asking now is, what will allow me to pursue Jesus with the most single-mindedness, with the least distractions in, yeah. in, 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 in who I am? Yeah, thanks, Shane. Uh, okay, Elizabeth, let's, uh, let's hear a little bit from you, and, and uh, you certainly, uh, your dad talks an awful lot about family and growing up, and he said this morning that uh, your mom gave him eight beautiful children, and you're one of them. Well, I, I'm far, on the far side from you, Shane. I'm the youngest of eight, yeah. so I didn't have that pressure of um, when's the next grandbaby going to come, or when are you getting married, or anything like that. And so, um, but there is a uh, feeling of wanting to be valuable and wanting to be significant that we all have and that we all want to um, be valuable and significant. And I truly believe that we need to, at least me, all right, I'm not going to speak for all of y'all. For me, my value and my worth comes from God. And once, once he laid his hand on me, I became valuable and significant. All right, good. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I, and I think that that's, that's something that's the theme that in the, in, in the kingdom of God is that our value does come from Christ. But society does put pressure on us. And I think I've heard a little bit of pressure uh, from, from all of you uh, on this thing. Now, Elizabeth, I think you have probably the most experience of ministry here. And that you've been working in the community, you head the ministry up there in, uh, in Jackson in the, the Perkins Foundation and working with lots of kids. And as you take your singleness into working with young people, uh, tell us a little bit about what that looks like for you and, and some of the things that you've been thinking about. Well, you know, we place such a high value on getting married. And, you know, the girls, you know, look forward to... Uh, wearing that white dress and walking down the aisle. But in my community, 49% um, of black women will not get married. Wow. That's a high statistic. And 51% of all women won't get married. So for me to, to say, oh, darling, you know, to put, a lot of, no, no, to put a lot of focus on getting married, that means if they're not chosen, if they're not chosen by a man, then that means that they're not valuable and they're not significant. So for me, I think it's important for me to um, just affirm who they are in Christ, affirm them as beautiful young ladies and not as, um, oh, you're going you're gonna to be complete. Oh, that's, this is what I want to say. Y'all know that saying? You know, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, no, seriously, you, you complete me. Y'all know from that, that movie, you complete me. I was, thinking, I was thinking about this this morning, and I said, boy, that is such a damaging statement. You know, and 
that is, but it came such, such a big statement. And then people who were in love and wanting to get married were saying it to each other. And, and, uh, and I was thinking, that is such a damaging statement for girls, for young girls and, and young guys to hear because that, that's telling them, I'm incomplete without somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, for me, it's all about just affirming who they are in Christ, affirming them, affirming, affirming. Um, and if God chooses to give them a mate, then I think it should be, or we should look at it as the cherry on top mm -hmm. and not the whole cake. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, Elizabeth, that makes me, that makes me think a lot about uh, this whole idea when, you know, sometimes people say you complete me and, and thinking about that. And, and Chrissy, you're talking about expectations and things. Let, why, don't we, why don't you all share a little bit with us, I don't know who has a story right to start with, but of, of a time in your life that you felt this pressure and it seems like if you aren't married, you're not normal. And how maybe those of us who are married have felt, made you feel that way or others have pushed you that way. Um, does anybody have a thought on that that could talk about that? I do. All right. <laughs> you just keep that microphone. <laughs> no. Well, I, I had a conversation recently um, about, you know, salaries and that kind of thing. And, you know, it was like, well, you, you shouldn't make that kind of money. And I said, why not? And don't get me wrong, I don't make a lot of money. All right, let's. Um, and uh, they said to me, you shouldn't because you don't have a family. Yeah, yeah. How'd that make you feel? Like. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell I'm not the sensitive type, I guess. But. Yeah, and that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it didn't, it, it didn't affirm you who you are in that way. Uh, yeah, yeah, for me, I think uh, there's definitely, in terms of like cultural pressure, whether it be a Latino family, I know um, also Asian families, there's a lot of pressure in terms to have kids and to be married and all of that. Um, but, all right, so I don't, I don't come from a, uh, an educational uh, heritage or a heritage of education in, in family generations. And so uh, my parents, though they want me to be married and have kids, you know, I'm the first one to graduate, go to college, graduate, and first one to be working on my master's. And so my mom and dads and my grandmother, you know, they also kind of like, you know, you're the only one to do this, and we want you actually to, to achieve those things. Now, had I, had I gone, um, had I had parents that were educated and grandparents or what have you, and raised up and was being able to be tutored because my parents were, were working all the time. So my grandmother, all she knew was Spanish, and so she couldn't tutor me with my homework. So I, I fell behind. I didn't finish high school. I didn't get past the 10th grade. I dropped out. There was other things going on there. But had I had that educational background, maybe there would be more opportunity to risk maybe getting married in college years before finishing college and not finishing college. Uh, but, but yeah, so not having that, it puts more pressure to actually get my education mm -hmm. uh, because if I get married and I have kids, it's harder to kind of make it because I know I worked for, for college many years and they won't hire you unless you have not just your undergrad, but your master's and maybe even sometimes your PhD. And so I have a dominant culture telling me, well, you need your papers in order to be considered for a position or whatever. But then, you know, I have, I have family members. It's like, hey, we want you to have a family, all these things, but we understand dominant culture. Go ahead and pursue that education. So when I go home and I look at my grandmother, my abuelita, and I, and I look at her eyes and I see some of the poverty there in the home, I'm inspired to actually do school. And so some of that pressure is taken off of me, to yeah. be honest, yeah. uh, because of the demands of, of the culture in which I live. Yeah, yeah. Chrissy, you have any time that somebody you felt pressuring you and insensitive to you uh, because you're, you're, you're single? I don't know that I would call it so much insensitive this story a lot of times you see people's good intentions and I think my favorite is when you get up to speak and they're like and guys she's single can you believe it like this beautiful woman is single and you're like because like what Elizabeth was saying what it what it kind of says is that um what's wrong with you if you're pretty but you're not married and then the reverse is I know a lot of homely people who are married <laughs> so you know what and and so there's this sense of you know, and, and not just that, but 
you know, that if people said to me, you're really cool, how come you're not married? You know, and so there's this kind of sense of, um, well, if this and this and this, you're smart and you're cute and whatever, you know, then, what, then, what's, mis then what's wrong? And, and so that, that's something I've had to kind of work through and that it has become like a lie in my mind that I have to play through. I mean, it was hard enough to finally believe that I'm pretty. And then now that I'm finally beginning to believe that, well, then how come I'm not married? You know, so it's kind of these, yeah. this cycle of things that you, um, again, and just coming back to saying like, who does Jesus say that I am? Who yeah. am I in the word? And where do I get my identity? And I, and I believe that um, if I get married someday and, and I know that my friends who are married, that, that's the truth for all of us, that we have to find our identity rooted in who Christ Jesus says that we are. Yeah, I think, I think what I'm hearing all of you say is that we, we sometimes who are married are very insensitive to you in your single lifestyle by some, like probably a well-intentioned statement, you know, this is such a pretty girl, pretty young woman, why is she not married? Some men, anybody would like to date her, you know, you can give her, what's your You're phone number? You're not doing number? it right now, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> so it's very easy for us to do that. Now, now Paul, Paul says this to all of us, and, and sometimes I think we almost forget the Bible in all of this, but in, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, it's verse 8, it says this, now to the unmarried, and widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. Shane, you mentioned that some of your heroes in the faith, of course, Jesus and Paul, were single. Let's talk a little bit about some of the advantages of being single and how that's just helped you to have ministry. Let's, let, why don't you all give us a, an example of that? We'll start you, with you, Shane. You know, one of the first people to open up my eyes to some of this was uh, a guy named Rich Mullins, who's a singer and songwriter, you know, that some of us are probably familiar with some of his songs, but he was, uh, I, I had some time with him while, while we were at Wheaton College, and I said, why, why are you, you know, 40 years old and, and not married? And he said, why would I not be? You know, and, and he opened up that scripture and also Matthew 19, where Jesus, the disciples are going, whoa, if, th if this is the case, then, then it's better not to marry. And Jesus says, well, the person that can accept that word should accept it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it really shifts your language when you think maybe the norm is that we say we're going to pursue Jesus. And if we can be single in that pursuit, uh, then, then thanks be to God. And if God should choose to give us someone else to walk with, then thanks be to God, you know. And, and uh, it was really through that that, I mean, uh, not just rich, but then over and over I began to see people throughout history that I think are heroes uh, and also sheroes of the church, you know, uh, that live that life. And even within CCDA, folks, that I, I, one of the things I really love about CCDA and our diversity is this is one thing that we, I, I think we're, we're, we're good at, is, is celebrating that there are a lot of different ways of doing ministry and folks on the board, John Bowie and, and Mary Nelson, others have like lived lives of such integrity uh, in their ministries with, you know, so much uh, years and in, in wisdom behind their journeys, and I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Tell us a little bit about the advantage you've sensed. You know, as Paul says, it's good, you know, you, you can focus. What's, what's happened in your life in that? Well, I, I went to Iraq in the middle of the bombing. I might have thought twice about that. Um, <laughs> no, no, but I mean, really, literally, like, there's things that I feel like I've been able to... Um, uh, not ask questions uh, in the same way that I would if I'm married, and I don't think that means that one's better than the other. But I, I actually think that like uh, uh, that the, there's there's a simplicity that comes in in going. Well, it's one thing if I pick up a hitchhiker and die, you know. Well, what, you know, but if if I got you know other folks I'm responsible for, and then then that uh, it, there's there's I think a single mindedness, and that's what uh, monasticism. Uh, the the beginning of the word is mono, which is the one thing to will one thing to run after one thing, and for Jesus to be that pursuit for a lot of people in history is meant saying no to all other lovers. And I just love the the innocence of that, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you've been willing to. It's given you freedom to take some risks that maybe you wouldn't if you were a husband and, and a father with some children. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, these ideas of like uh, the consider the lilies and the sparrows. Well, that that's pretty. You know, I I actually. I feel like, uh, I mean, I, I still know where I'm going to sleep and how I'm going to eat, but, you know, yeah. I, I also have never really thought too much about a retirement fund and, you know, yeah. you know all that kind of stuff. And I think that there's, there's really um, 
uh, a, a recklessness that you can have in the pursuit of Jesus and the abandonment of stuff, you know, yeah. and also a critique that we have of this uh, consumer culture that yeah. has created uh, an appetite out of sexuality as well, you know, and it's something that we have to have and get and long for. And I think that that the the simplicity of singleness is a critique of the culture that's infatuated with sex. Yeah, yeah. One of you have a. Uh, Chrissy, a benefit of being single in ministry, how that's helped you? Sure. I, a lot of it has to do with, like what Shane was saying, just freedom of choices that I, I don't have to confer with someone else or, you know, kind of think even about someone else, which I guess could be a downside also. Um, I, I've learned a lot of, of uh, to appreciate my singleness from being in friendships with married women. And a lot of times we'll be trying to get together and I'll call and say, oh, I'm on my way over or whatever. And I can hear them just like the craziness in their house, just the work that it takes for them to leave their house. And, you know, I was kind of laughing with um, one friend on the phone about that and we hung up and I was driving and I was early, and I, which is rare, and I, I just thought, you know, I'm gonna enjoy this as long as I have it. Like, I have a freedom right now. I'm driving in my car. I don't have four people like pulling on me, asking me stuff. I'm just here, me and Jesus hanging out in the car. and. I really began to enjoy the freedom that, that, that I had to, um, to choose to get up and, and really, in a lot of ways, do what I want that day. And uh, so I think there's a, a real freedom that I've learned to enjoy. Yeah. Marcos, how have you seen when you've been now in your singleness and ministry, particularly maybe back at La Vieta in Chicago, uh, that that's been helpful for you? It's allowed you, what's the benefit of singleness in your ministry? Yeah, you know, Dr. Burgess talked a lot about pride and all of that. And so I think for me, man, it helps me understand just the whole, it goes deeper in understanding maybe humility and all those things. Because I've been through the singleness at this point in my life. I'm going to be 34, December 31st. And um, it allows me to be able to understand that mindset. And I'm dating somebody now, and, and we're talking about uh, marriage and all those things and going forward. So Is there, when, are there any announcements? No announcements yet, no. but maybe forthcoming next CCDA. But... Uh -huh. um, Maybe. Yeah, I maybe. Like, yeah, I like yeah, the maybe. Yeah, we definitely though. talk okay, about yeah. we keep submitting before the Lord. Uh, but uh, it's a cross-cultural relationship. I'm doing an intercultural studies program at Fuller, and part of our practicum is that you have to date somebody outside of your culture. <laughs> so she, she's a... Uh, Being the good she, student that you right. are, you've done that's a good right. job. That's right. Good job, yeah, Marcos. Yeah, yeah. She's Korean from Canada. But uh, so it helps me <laughs> out, man. But... Uh, but yeah, so, so having gone through the season, I think, of the fire of just dealing with all the stuff that kind of gets at you and, and wears on you and it gets you tired and it, some of the things in terms of like, you, it's been a frustration. I, I know you want benefit, but let me, to be able to highlight sure. the benefit, I think it's been hard when you work in youth ministry and, and you're, you're going on 34 and you're working with young, young adults, maybe just people who are just coming straight out of college, and they look at you as a peer, which is cool, but almost sometimes to a fault because they don't recognize maybe that there is some distance there because you're single and because you don't have kids and all those things. And so they, they just, again, and in some of that, there's this internal uh, competitiveness going on. You're like, hey, we don't have to compete, brother, sister, man. I, there's a sense that I do have eight years on you, which you will have that too one day to experience. But sometimes that's hard because they don't necessarily respect the fact that you have some years on them. And then the older folk, obviously, because you're hanging out with the youth and the kids and stuff like that, so then they treat you like a kid or they talk to you and it's very, you know, parental or what have you, and maybe where they don't talk about, you know, talk to the associate pastor like that, you know what I mean? But they talk to you, mm -hmm. you know, they could violate, you know, maybe certain boundaries that you would want to have or time, commitments and things like that. You know, think because you're single, you should just be able to. Now, I know that well, you, Paul, you can give yourself more to the Lord because you're single, but that still means we need our time to do our stuff. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, it don't mean you can have all our time. You know what I mean? So, um, so I think that that is frustrating. But the benefit now to answer your question, man, is that it's cool because I can be able to experience that, right? Mm -hmm. And understand that. And respect that so when, when, one day when I am married, I can understand that with my single brothers and sisters, what they're going through and be able to sympathize, empathize. I'm not sure which one is the right word, but maybe do both for that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you'll do both. You, you want to add some? Well, I was just going to add with that, I think there's a, in talking about freedom, that there's an ability to be present where I'm at. Mm. And even with my brothers and sisters come in here, you know, a lot of them, they're checking back in at home and they have to do that. And, and I have some responsibilities, but I think it allows me to be more present mm. where I'm at. Yeah, present where you are, yeah. Elizabeth, how I, about you? I What's some of the benefits of being single in ministry? Well, I, I, I just want to give you an example of freedom. Um, I think, well, 
I used to have a, a five, no, a 6.30 a.m. Bible study. But how it worked was my girls would sleep over at night on Tuesday night, and we'd have the Bible study on Wednesday. Mm. I couldn't do that if I was married. Yeah. And so, and in, in, in later on, I went back. Uh, it was actually at one of the CCDAs that was in California. And the girls, I asked them, I said, why did you come to that Bible study? And I thought it was because we was cooking grits and eggs and, uh, and, and uh, grand's biscuits, the big biscuits for breakfast. And they said, because of the sleepover and because you were the only somebody who cared about us. Yeah. So um, that overnight stay was so important to them. Every Tuesday night, we would, uh, I would tell them, you know, because we were poor, and I would say, y'all bring y'all some Roman noodles and we're going to heat them up one by one in the microwave and sit around my <laughs> table. And that was the only dinner that they had at a table hmm. throughout that week. And so um, that was, yeah. you know, it was freedom, but it sure. was also, you know, yeah. 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 Good. Shane, um, oh, you know, I've had the privilege of knowing you and, uh, and it's been a great privilege. You've been a wonderful person. We're looking forward to hearing from you on Saturday night in your plenary address. But, you know, we've had conversations over the years of, you know, you thinking a little bit about celibacy and is God calling you to that? And I think a lot of singles that I've talked to have at least think a little bit about that. Can you share with us a little bit of your journey on that and, and a vow of celibacy or where, where, where that is? Just share your journey. Well, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that there, one of the things that's been important to me is to realize that our le life has different stages and, and that to, uh, and even our language about uh, singleness or in, in abstinence in, in the young adult world uh, is very flawed. I mean, you know, these whole campaigns of true love waits. And we don't really think through, like, how long are you waiting? <laughs> and, then, and, like, what are you waiting for? You know, and, uh, and, and uh, so, I mean, I, I, I kind of I, I began to sort of question that. And, and I think that our, our, our challenge in the church is always um, to be careful not to over-exaggerate the things that we've neglected. And so I really was so driven to singleness that I almost made an idol out of that, you know. Um, and, and I think that the important thing for me is, so I haven't taken a lifetime vow. I've taken different periodic vows of going, I'm going to be single and see what I feel the Spirit say to me in that. But I think to, to go for the rest of my life, I'm going to do this, like, I love that some people feel called to do that. I've never felt the divine gift. I got some serious libido, you know. So I like, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I I've been figuring that out, you know, um, and and, uh, um, and and this is one thing that I've really learned though is, is that uh, that's where community is so important because uh, just because we're single doesn't mean we're lonely, and no one is called. Uh, to be, you know, this radical Christian on their own. Every single one of us is longing for love and for intimacy, and we need community. Biological family is not the only way to find that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we, we want to be careful not just to focus on the family. Sorry, you know, but, uh, like, we want to focus, focus on Jesus. And, and, uh, and, and, <clears throat> And so as I've done that, you know, I, I've really been discerning that my communities help me and they've seen me in my struggles. And I've got guy friends that ask me some hard questions and they know my vulnerabilities. When I travel, you know, a lot these days, I travel almost everywhere in pairs. And, and some of that's that accountability, you know. And when my friends ask me my hard questions, the last one is, did you lie about any of your answers? You know, so, so I think that's, that's important to have that transparency and to be able to, uh, to, to you know, uh, confess when, we, when we've stumbled. And I, I'm able to do that. Uh, I think confession is one of the healing things that we have to have. Um, and one of the other things that I've, I've really learned um, as, as I've, I've seen a lot of tears of my own and Elizabeth and so many others is that if our only models for urban ministry 
our married folks, we do a grave injustice to so many people, um, and, and especially, I think, to gay and lesbian people, which we can debate what, you know, all the dynamics of why someone doesn't feel attracted to the opposite gender. Um, but in the end, I've met people over and over that with tears rolling down their faces say, when I'm in the church, I feel like God made a mistake when God made me. And that should break all of our hearts. You know, and if, if, if our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters can't um, find a loving, intimate community to try to become who God has created them to be, then who are we, you know, as a church? I think we've really fallen short. Yeah. So, our, you know, I, I really want to be a place where um, marriage is celebrated and family is celebrated, but where that's not the only model that we have for, for um, uh, Christian discipleship and urban ministry. Yeah. Real quick, too, one that just you talk about true love waits, and I would say sometimes false love waits, and you talk about the brothers. And I know that I've been talking with, with, with just guys and accountability and all of that. And what I mean by false love waits is that sometimes, I guess, urban brothers of color in the neighborhood there's uh we talked and sometimes it seems like graduating from college and then coming to work in lawndale serving there for a while and then realizing like hey man there's a lot more sisters than there are brothers in the church and especially when you're talking about when you talk talk about specific demographics even more so apparent as as that's the case and so brothers sometimes we we we, we just like well you know what man we're gonna we're gonna wait a while, you know what I mean, before we choose, you know, a sister that we want to marry. And, um, and sometimes that's just pride, you know what I mean, and it's not this true love wait thing going on, and we just think, well, wait, you know, something better always come around. You know, you think about the first gen or the iPhone, don't get the first gen of the iPhone, get the, you know, wait for the third gen to come out, you know what I mean? And then you start getting older, but that's, that's not a good thing, obviously, because it's just this pride thing. Um, and I think that that right there has been one of those things where you have to check, and us brothers have to check sometimes, because we see sometimes that, okay, yeah, there is more women in the church, and we have to, we have to uh, watch our pride and watch what's flesh and what's of the Lord. If the Lord is calling us to go forward in a relationship, or if, or if we're turning into kind of like these subtle pimps in the church, obviously. And so we need, to, we need to really look out for that as brothers, man, and have brothers call us on that. You know what I mean? Don't, don't, don't play these sisters. Don't lead them. You see they're interested, all 10 of them in the small church, you know what I mean, that of only 15. <laughs> And you can't take it out every single one. And so uh, we need to be very careful on that as brothers, as our sisters are definitely wanting brothers to step up. And when we come onto the scene, it's just kind of like, man, all right, you know, and we're nobody to be playing that role. You know, we have to be very humble about that. And so, yeah, I would think all that right. that's been good. Brother, I ain't no iPhone. That's right. You ain't no iPhone. <laughs> ain't no iPhone. All right. Yes. Okay. Sisters well, ain't no iPhone. I lost control, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> We, we kind of have two goals here today, and one is CCDA, you know, CCDA and who we are. We want to affirm the part of our body of CCDA that's single and in their singleness. And so we, we affirm all four of you and all of you who raised your hands. We're, we're blessed by you, and you're so special and made you're all making a wonderful impact. And, and as you said, Shane, we want, we want everybody not to feel weird, but to feel good in who they are. But I think we have a second goal, and I'd like to ask the four of you to help us with this. And that is, how can we be more sensitive to you? What, what, what would you want from those of us as leadership of CCDA, as well as those of us who are married, to help you? What, what do you need to tell us that we just are clueless about, all right? Anybody have a thought to tell us where we're clueless? We don't get it. We're not doing it right. Well, I know we're not well, doing I it right. I would, so say, somebody... I would say the way, the, the way that uh, maybe people who are older and who are married, the way that they talk to us. Uh, you know, uh, I had to talk with some, some pastors in the past about just, again, it seems as if the way that they talk to other pastors that are, that are their same age or older and they have families or what have you is very more thought out and more respectful, but when, when, when I'm being talked to, it almost seems I'm being talked down to uh, because I'm single, mm -hmm. or, or I mean, I'm, I mean, my particular ministry is youth ministry, and so it just seems as if, yeah, I get lumped in as if I don't have any mm -hmm. thoughts to share, or, and then that gets carried over, I think, onto the congregation, yeah. and so how the, the leadership of the church, the older leadership kind of treats me, the congregation follows that, yeah. you know, and yeah. that's there, and it's picked up on yeah. Uh, by, yeah. by the yeah. congregation. Okay, so... Respect, yeah. dignity. Yeah, Chrissy? 
Well, I guess I would just say, because a guy's single, that's not necessarily enough in common for us to go together. Mm -hmm. um, I, <laughs> oh, he's single, what about him? I was in, in a, I'm in this pastor's prayer network and you know, I know that those brothers love me and they, they want me, well, they, you know, we want you to be happy as if I'm not happy now, but you know, that, um, and s the mayor came to our prayer breakfast. Our mayor in our, my city is an honorary minute man and he's single. And so one of the pastors said, what about the mayor? He's single, what about him? <laughs> And I'm thinking, what about his life and his xenophobia and the policies that he's made reflect anything that would go along with me in the way that I'm living? You know, and I just thought, are you totally clueless? Like, so I think that just, you know, we want to be, if I'm going to abuse somebody, I want it to be somebody who's a great partner in ministry, who understands the call of God that, on my life. I'm, I'm not just one to be with anybody. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Very good. Not just being too much of a matchmaker, huh? Yeah. I was, I was traveling one place with my mom to speak, and uh, they were like, is that your wife? I'm like, no, but she'll like it if you say that. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, people are always trying to hook you up. And, and uh, I, there, there's, a, there's a fantastic uh, point at one, at, at one moment in Mother Teresa's life where this reporter, I'm not sure where he lived, but for some reason he came up and asked her, so... Um, Sister, are you married? And she, she got a little sassy, and she said, Oh, yes, I sure am, and my spouse is so demanding. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, I, I think that actually one of the things that we can do um, within CCDA is, is really celebrate that Jesus is our lover. Yeah. And as you read Hosea, as you read the scriptures, that, that is something that is so dynamic and beautiful. And... And, 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 and so I, I think that's one of the, the things that we can do. And then that affects our language. You know, I think it w if we begin with that, that affects when we see single people. Rather than seeing that, wow, wonder, wonder why they haven't met someone. Like, like maybe what we see is maybe that they're so in love with Jesus. Mm -hmm. That that's mm -hmm. what has centered their life around to the point that, that that's enough for them. You know, and, and, and maybe we have a lot to learn from that. So then when you, we come up to people, I think you, even just saying things like um, the, the language of when, when you get married, if you notice, almost every one of us has said if, if we get married, you know, and that's really, really important. Even as we're mentoring young people to, to, to think you might get married, you may not, you know, and to have healthy models for what that can look like if you don't, you know, because as Elizabeth said, so many don't. So like part of my witness in my neighborhood has been able to speak out of that singleness. And now as I'm dating, the kids ask new questions. They're like, why, my, my girlfriend lives down the block and they say, why don't you guys live together? Why don't, they see me walking down the block sometimes at midnight. And they're like, why don't you just sleep at our house? And I'm like, because we're not married. And let me yeah. talk to you about that. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, we, we I don't, as things happen, this time has flown by and we're basically about out of time. But let, Elizabeth, let's just, I'm going to give all four of you, we'll start with Elizabeth, if, just one last thing you want to say. Is there anything that you'd wanted to say and we didn't give you a chance to? Well, I think uh, as far as us being a community um, and a community of married folks and, of sing and single people, I think it's important that uh, the married people understand we have, we have this freedom and sometimes we do have a lot of time and a lot of freedom. And sometimes it's good if we're invited over mm. and, uh, and to be a part of a family. Yeah. And uh, so I think that would be helpful, okay. just to know that the people in your community who are, or in your organization who are single, um, sometimes they want to be invited over to just hang out. So. Okay, good. Chrissy, what's uh, one, any closing th thought that maybe you wanted to say something you didn't get a chance to? Are you good? I'm good. I think we've covered a lot of good stuff. Okay. Marcos, want to say? Nope. I know. I've never known you not to say something. I know. Yeah. I don't really have anything more to say, man. It's just uh, blessings on all my single people out there, man. God shalom on every one of us. Amen. Amen. Like yeah. Let's, uh, Shane will close us in prayer. And I want to close with just reading uh, uh, another verse out of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, it just says, uh, as Paul goes on and talks, and we've alluded to this passage, verse 17 says, Nevertheless, each of you should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to you, just as God 
has called you. And I, and I thank Shane and, and Elizabeth and Chrissy and uh, Marcos. I want to just thank you for your courage of being able to be vulnerable. Let's give them a round of applause. And we thank you for your courage. And uh, appreciate your willingness to share your story and your hearts with us. And uh, we feel the same about all of you uh, who are single. And we and CCDA, we, we love you, we affirm you, and we want to do better at that. And so, Shane, if you would just maybe uh, pray for, for all of us and for CCDA and singles and what God has for you. Let's, let's join together in prayer. Oh, God of love, God who is love, we pray that you would whisper to each one of us how beloved we are. And then out of that love, you would remind us that we are complete in you. Surround us all with community that moves us closer to you and to who you want us to be. I thank you for this conversation, God, and, and I, I thank you for all the folks in this room who are trying to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And we pray for your guidance that you would be a light into our path that you would help us to pursue you, Jesus, with all that we are, and that if we have someone alongside of us in a family, a husband or a wife, we thank you, and we also thank you for the gift of singleness. We thank you for the saints throughout history that have followed you with recklessness and, and abandonment in that single-mindedness. And God, we pray that you would make us all one as you are one, yes. that the world would know of your love. Mm. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Amen.